Hello, I'm Siobhan Sarna, and I wanted to say thank you so much for being here. This is a topic that is very, very near and dear to my heart. Uh, the skin, as we were just talking before I hit record, um, is the number one disease. Acne is the number one disease in the United States that people go to the doctor for. And um, we all know how it's a big miss out there in terms of the treatments for that. Today's presentation is about eczema. And Dr. Julie Greenberg is my very special guest. Now, this is an opportunity for you to fill in the gaps of what you didn't learn in medical school. And it is about eczema today, but her specialty and her specialty is root cause dermatology. She is a naturopath. She has taken this on as a huge passion. She is practicing in a very limited way based on her state licensure and how much time she has. So part of her mission, which is part of my mission, is to get this information out to as many people as possible to help you all as practitioners help your patients and the ripple effect that will it will happen. Um, the, the glow, because I know as a healer, you came online to heal the planet and that's my goal. And I know that's Dr. Julie Greenberg's goal as well. So my company is Chronic Condition Rescue. If you just came in, hi, I'm Siobhan Sarna. And I also have a huge platform for SIBO. You may know me from the times I've worked with Dr. Allison Seebecker with SIBO and the 11 summits that I've done and my book, Healing SIBO. So I advocate for the patients and I love connecting doctors and practitioners and researchers with the patients. I do occasionally help professionals with professional trainings. And that's what I'm doing here today. So thank you all so much for coming. If you are a patient and you're like, oh, that sounds good. Just wanted to come in and learn about eczema. That's cool. Welcome. Please just, you know, know that it is a professional training and use this for your information. That's great. What I also want to say is that Dr. Greenberg does have a professional training for licensed practitioners. And we're going to be talking about that at the end. This is sort of to celebrate that. This isn't an infomercial for that. But I know, I like, I literally was like, I should become, I should become a, a healer and study with Dr. Greenberg. I mean, like that's how turned on I got. And I'm like, no, Siobhan, you are the announcer, the cheerleader, <laughs> the broadcaster. Like, okay, okay, that, that's my role. So anyway, I'm gonna hand things over to Dr. Dr. Julie Greenberg. We'll talk about the course at the end, but it's very exciting and a really big opportunity for those of you who wanna help your patients who are suffering with skin conditions. With that, I hand things over to you, my friend. It's good to see you. Thank you so much, Siobhan. It's good to see you. And thank you all of you for coming. I know your time is valuable as practitioners, and I hope I'm going to give you some really good information today to help you uh, treat your patients with eczema. So let me share my screen. <clears throat> and hopefully you guys are all looking at my screen now. All right, so the topic of this talk is addressing the root cause of eczema, the gut microbiome, and we're going to connect all these pieces. So as Siobhan already introduced me, I'm Dr. Julie Greenberg. I'm a licensed naturopathic doctor and a registered herbalist. Um, I practice through my clinic, the Center for Integrative and Naturopathic Dermatology, and I have the course's site, Root Cause Dermatology. I got my uh, degree in naturopathic medicine from Bastyr University, and I also hold degrees from Stanford University and Northwestern University. All right, let's start with the pathophysiology. So we're all here as clinicians because you know we wanna treat the root causes of disease. We wanna get down, figure out what's going wrong in our patients and correct that instead of just using suppressive medications. And these are this is what our patients are coming to us for is this root cause medicine. So when I'm trying to you know break down a disease and figure out what are the root causes, I'm always gonna start with the pathophysiology, basically what's going wrong in the body. So let's look at eczema, and you're going to hear me use the terms eczema and atopic dermatitis interchangeably. Atopic means allergic, dermatitis means skin inflammation, and, and these are basically the same thing. So what is eczema? Well, fundamentally, it is a disease of skin barrier dysfunction, right? We know this. We can see in this little baby, if you've ever had eczema, if you've had patients with eczema, you know that there's a real problem going on with the skin barrier. And it's a problem of inflammation. And I'm not just talking about surface inflammation on the skin. Obviously, that's happening. I'm talking about deep systemic inflammation. This is where we're going to get to the root cause and help clean this up for patients. 
So let's travel on back to immunology class. I know it's probably been a few years for some of us, but it's really worth uh, doing this review so that we can understand how eczema is really a systemic inflammatory disease and much more than just you know a rash here or there on the skin. So let's talk about T cells, right? T cells are a type of immune cell. Of course, we have lots of immune cells, but the TH or T helper cells, we know are drive a lot of different types of diseases. And when I say eczema and atopic or allergic dermatitis, hopefully you guys are already thinking of this TH2 pathway. This is the allergic pathway. So we can see what would drive TH2 cell production, things like worms or fungus and allergens, right? The allergic pathway. And let's step back and look, okay, so we've got this T cell. And when we first create a T cell in our body, we produce a naive T cell. And the reason is that our body is like, waiting to hear information on where the problem is and what the problem is. And just like our armed forces, you know, we have an army in case the threat comes by land, we have a navy in case the threat comes by sea, and we have an air force in case the threat comes by air. We have to be able to respond in different ways to different things within our body. So these dendritic cells are information passing cells, and they are the ones that pass information to the naive T cell and let them know where a problem is, and then it will activate it to go on and fulfill its destiny. So the organ systems that contain these dendritic or information passing cells are organ systems that interface with outside world. What does that mean? It's, it's just what it sounds like, like any organ system that's gonna to touch the outside. So of course our skin, right? From the minute we're born, that is the number one job of skin, interface with outside world, protect us. Now, if you get a paper cut, that may seem innocuous, but there could be a ton of bacteria. So that dendritic cell is gonna immediate, immediately grab that information, pass it to the naive T cell and activate it so we can respond to the threat. Our respiratory tract, of course, right? That's how we get the flu or COVID or any kind of illness. We're breathing in air from the outside and bringing it into our lungs. So our respiratory tract interfaces with outside world. And of course our gut or GI tract, right? Every time we swallow saliva, eat a bite of food or drink, we're bringing outside world in. So all of these organ systems have the dendritic cells and they're gonna pass information. So we already said eczema is a TH2 driven uh, disease, and we know this. And so once we create the TH2 cell in response to the worm, the fungus, or the allergens, then we start producing inflammatory cytokines, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. And if these sound familiar, you may know the current drugs today, like Dupixent or Dupilumab, the injectable biologic, is trying to just suppress this pathway. So it's not doing anything like to ask the question, why is the body doing this and how can we calm this? It's just coming over here and saying, we're just gonna quash the response and we're not gonna even ask questions about what's going on. Obviously that's, that's not the kind of medicine that we're practicing. The really interesting thing though with eczema is that we've learned that there's other pathways involved. So TH22 is tissue inflammation. So of course that's gonna be involved. But TH1 and TH17 pathways can be involved in eczema. And when we see, well, why would we be having a TH1 response? Intracellular bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. And we might be having a TH17 response due to extracellular bacteria and fungus at mucocutaneous sites. Now, what's a mucocutaneous site? Well, all of these sites, all of these organ systems that we just talked about. So if we have bacterial or fungal overgrowth in the gut, we're gonna be driving this. And so it's good to keep these in mind. Uh, I'm gonna be doing a case study. I'm gonna be showing you one of my patients and um, you know, spoiler alert, I do gut microbiome testing and I'm gonna be showing you the results and let's keep in mind things like protozoa and bacteria and fungus and things we're gonna be finding in the system that could be driving the systemic inflammation. All right, so when it comes to eczema, I think the kind of elephant in the room is, is food. And a lot of practitioners, you know, get really stuck on food and a lot of patients. I can't tell you the number of patients that come in and say, oh my gosh, you know, they're exasperated for either their, themselves or their children. We've tried everything, you know, we've cut out everything. I'm down to eating three foods. We can't figure out what's driving the eczema. So let's see, should we be really like narrowing in on food allergies when we're treating our eczema patients? Okay, so... Food allergy. I think if you have an infant or a child with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, then food allergy is a good place to look. This, this is a common trigger for this group. 
but it is not likely to be a trigger for older children and adults. And so if you've got older kid or, or adult patients, which you're going to have a lot if you treat eczema, you know, just really getting stuck on the food piece isn't going to be extremely helpful. Now, what kind of food should we be looking at? Uh, in a study that was done in the early 2000s, they found that about 75% or three quarters of the food induced eczema flares were due to five different food groups. So milk or dairy, eggs, wheat or gluten, soy, and peanuts. And these can be various types of reactions, right? It can be an IgE true food allergy, or it can be more of a food sensitivity like IgG and IgA. It's worth experimenting with these food groups. Personally, I take every eczema patient off of all dairy and it's anything that originally came from a mammal mama. So, you know, I've had patients say, you know, what about sheep's milk or goat's milk? Nope, that's out. Camel milk, <laughs> that's out. And any form, cheese, you know, milk, yogurt, sour cream. I really have yet to meet the eczema patient where dairy is doing them any favors. But the rest of these, you know, I can do some experimentation and see if it's going to impact them or not. Now, food, there's really interesting connection with ear infections. So you're going to find that most of your eczema patients will report that if they're adults, that they used to have a lot of ear infections, or if you're treating a pediatric eczema population, like I do as well, they're going to be having a lot of ear infections. And because I take all my patients off of dairy and I also experiment with gluten elimination, I was seeing that like all of the ear infections were clearing up and I couldn't explain it, right? Obviously I know my patients aren't putting dairy and wheat into their ears, but I just knew that it worked and I was like, just trust me. And really almost every time it cleared it up. I finally got the answer at a conference. Um, and of course, you know, ear infections are, are really problematic because chronic ear infections they're going to be prescribed antibiotics, which is going to, you know, wreck their gut microbiome. And in the worst case scenarios, they're going to get tympanostomy tube insertions where they cut a hole and insert a tube to drain it to kind of try to prevent the infection. So that's pretty invasive. We know that ear infections are caused by the middle ear here, the eustachian tube. And at this conference I attended, there was a kind of functional medicine ENT who was talking and he finally made the connection, which is it's in, in the embryology. So what builds the middle ear, the eustachian tube is the first and third pharyngeal arches of the developing fetus. And that also goes on to make the digestive system. And he does IgG food sensitivity testing in his patients. And he tested 44 of his patients whose Chronic ear infections were so bad that they had to have those tampanostomy tube insertions. And this is what he found. 70% reacted to cow's milk, 43% reacted to gluten, 27% to eggs, 7% to yeast, and 7% to soybean. Four out of five of these are the ones we just saw on the 75% of flares. So just a little clinical pearl here. If your patients are having ear infections, even if they don't have eczema, I think trying to cut out dairy and gluten is a really good start and then eggs. I, I find that this is kind of a good representation of what I find works in my patients. All right. So the big question is, do food allergies cause eczema? Now, a lot of people I think would immediately say yes, but the answer is maybe. And here's why, because up to two thirds of patients with eczema don't show any sensitization or allergies to any kind of foods or environmental allergens. So maybe in a third of patients, but not in two thirds. Now, again, I'm not saying that cutting out and eliminating certain food groups like dairy and wheat in particular won't help certain individuals. It absolutely can. But don't get stuck here on the food piece in your eczema patients if it's not working. I think this is the number one problem that most practitioners make when it comes to eczema. Let's flip the question though. Let's ask, does eczema cause food allergies? And this may feel like a really weird question because we usually don't think about it this way, but the answer is we actually think so. And I'm going to explain this to you. So what's interesting is food sensitization is six times more likely to develop in kids with atopic dermatitis than those without. And it doesn't even need to be eczema per se, it's just any skin barrier disruption um, in, a in a neonatal patient. So neonatal skin barrier dysfunction at birth will predict a child getting allergies by the age of two. 
And children with skin barrier defects are much more likely to develop asthma as well. Okay, so what's going on? How can e eczema be causing food allergies or asthma? Well, the answer is a leaky skin. So we're gonna talk about leaky gut, and I know you all know what leaky gut is, but maybe you guys haven't heard of leaky skin. Let's talk about it. Let's look over here on the left-hand side of the page. So this is normal skin. This is what we want, a nice intact skin barrier, right? We've got uh, nothing, nothing is getting through. So allergens like mites or dust, uh, food particles, you know, viruses, dander, nothing is breaching this skin, right? We've got an intact barrier. And remember we talked about those dendritic cells at, on the immunology slide, the information passing cells. Well, they're not getting any information because there's no problem. There's no breach in the skin barrier. This is what we wanna see on skin. This is the way it's supposed to be working. Now let's go over to this right side with the damaged skin. This is representative of, of course, eczematous skin. And what do we see? That there's barrier disruption, as we talked about. There's holes in it. And so things are getting through the skin that shouldn't be. Mites, dust, food particles, you know, dog dander, all the things that people become allergic to. They get down. Now those dendritic cells wake up and they say, whoa, whoa, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. I'm going to show you to the immune system, and they do, and that triggers that TH2 pathway that we saw on that immunology slide. Dendritic cell passing information to a naive T, naive T cell and activating it. And when this happens, particularly in neonates and very young um, children, this is an improper introduction um, to the immune system of otherwise innocuous things, right? So we now know that we don't recommend putting peanut butter on a baby's cheek that's not the way we introduce it. We introduce it into the mouth because we don't want the peanut proteins to get through this way and the body to decide that that's a very bad you know, thing and we need to produce a huge immune response whenever we see peanuts. So this is the pathway for creating potentially asthma and food allergies. And of course, eczema is part of what is known as the atopic triad. And what that means is it's in a threesome with other atopic or allergic diseases, food, IgE food made food allergy and asthma. And a third, as we talked about, a third of all kids with early onset eczema are going to progress through this atopic march and are going to develop either food allergy or asthma or both. These are life threatening diseases. So stopping eczema could actually be life-saving for your pediatric patients. It could stop the atopic uh, march. All right, let's look at the gut. And um, we're going to look at eczema and dysbiosis and how, how can we actually connect you know, what's going on in the gut with what's going on in the skin. And we're going to look at some published literature as well. So the gut microbiome. I, I know you guys know this, but the average adult human has about three to five pounds of microbes in their gut. I just think that's an astounding number. That's like a hand weight, right? Everywhere we go, we're carrying around a hand weight of microbes and we're feeding them. So we're housing and feeding a hand weight of microbes for free. There's trillions of organisms. Like sometimes I just look down at my gut and I'm like, wow, it's like, you know, whole other world in there, you know, bacteria, fungus, viruses, archaea, bacteriophages, protozoa, worms. I mean, really a lot going on in there. Why do we have this, right? What are we getting out of this deal? Because it seems a little bizarre. Of course, we all know, you know, we can't survive without them. We've co-evolved together with these organisms. They make things we need and they crowd out pathogenic microbes and, you know, they maintain a healthy ecosystem in the gut. And of course, more than just the gut, right? I feel like every week there's new research showing the importance of a healthy gut microbiome on every aspect of our, you know, physical, mental, and every, really every aspect of health. So that is why I go and I test and treat the gut because I want to assess their digestive function. How are we bringing in food, breaking it down and eliminating it, right? As a naturopathic doctor, I ask a lot of questions about what's going in and how it's coming out and the microbiome. And the microbiome really also starts with the oral microbiome. So I ask questions about, you know, do you floss? How often? How often do you see a dentist? Do you have root canals? It's really the start of our digestive tract. And we swallow 2,000 times a day. So whatever's happening in the oral microbiome of your patients, it is affecting everything else downstream. 
So what does the research say about the gut microbiome of um, atopic dermatitis patients? Well, they do uh, tend to show that these eczema patients have lower levels of beneficial gut flora. So bifidobacterium, bacteroidetes, and bacteroides, and higher levels of pathogenic bacteria like C. diff, Clostridium difficile, E. coli, and Staph aureus. This talk, you know, we're really focused on the gut microbiome. We didn't have time to really get into the skin microbiome, but I will kind of let you know that a really key part of treating eczema is Staph aureus. And this organism lives in the, it, it colonizes the nose and it lives on the skin. And I guarantee you 100% of your eczema patients who are having a flare, they're having too much Staph aureus on the skin. And so kind of as a sidebar, you know, I do treat the nose and the skin and you do need to pay attention to Staph aureus, but it's also in the gut. And, and this makes sense, right? Our microbiomes in different places speak with one another, they get cross-pollinated. So Staph aureus is a big, big player in eczema. What about fungal organisms and candida? I find a lot, a lot of candida in my patients. So eczema patients in studies with GI growth of candida have a statistically significant correlation with candida albicans IgE antibodies. So they're producing this uh, allergic response to it. And what they have found that when they treat patients with antifungals, their skin gets better. And I 100% find this as well. Okay, leaky gut. So again, I know you guys like know all about leaky gut, so I won't belabor this, you know, for too long, but it is, um, it is important and it relates to the leaky skin. So it's kind of the same, right? When we looked at the leaky skin, the left side was the healthy skin and the right side was the compromised skin. Same thing here with the gut, right? The left side is the healthy gut and then the right side is the leaky gut. And let's talk about the healthy gut for a minute. So this is a cross section of the small intestine. And um, what we see up top is the lumen. The lumen is like the hole. So, you know, if you swallowed a little plastic ball, it would just ping pong through you and you could just poop it out, right? So that's the lumen. This is where the majority of our microbes live, those three to five pounds of bacteria. And um, the undigested food is in here. So we're gonna digest that. Then underneath it, of course, is our beautiful mucosal barrier in our gut, right? Our largest mucosal organ is really our GI tract. And that is um, protecting these cells of our intestines. They do have tight junctions to also create a barrier, but they have to live protected under the mucosal barrier. And then underneath our gut is our bloodstream. And that makes a lot of sense because the whole reason we eat other than it's yummy and we like it, is we have to you know, extract the nutrients up here and then get those nutrients down into the bloodstream. The bloodstream is a super highway to every cell in the body. So every cell needs those nutrients. And so the gut has important decisions to make. It has to let certain things through into the bloodstream, like nutrients, but it wants to keep other things out like bacteria you know, or candida and protozoa. And so that's the, the purpose of the mucosal barrier and the tight junctions between the cells. And we see here secretory IgA. I call them the Y guys because they're kind of shaped like a Y. And this is the immune system of the gut. And uh, with a nice, healthy um, mucosal barrier, we're going to have enough secretory IgA. Then we see some keystone species here. We see Acromancia mucinophila. Uh, this is Latin for loves mucus. So Acromancia mucinophila is a keystone species. And we can see that Acromancia lives in the kind of old top layer of the mucus and will eat that away, which is actually a good thing because it's going to stimulate these goblet cells to produce fresh new mucus. So Acromancia is a keystone or commensal bacteria. And Fecalibacterium prasnitiae is another commensal bacteria. We see here Fecalibacterium is floating around. We feed it fiber and it gives us butyrate. And we're gonna talk about butyrate in a minute. That's a short chain fatty acid. So we see you know, some reasons why we need these good gut microbes. They are gonna help maintain this healthy gut. Once again, we see the dendritic cells, totally quiet. They're not being alarmed by anything. So the immune system in the gut is calm in a healthy gut. But now when we go over to the leaky gut, we obviously see some big issues. The first is this mucosal barrier has been degraded. Um, that is a problem because now the intestinal cells are 
exposed to everything in the lumen that's not supposed to happen. They become inflamed. They cannot hold their tight junctions. They die. And now we see an open pathway into the bloodstream of things that do not belong there. LPS, of course, stands for lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin, right? We hear the word toxin, no bueno. It degrades the mucosal barrier and it drives inflammation. And we can see here some secretory IgA trying to grab onto it, but when you have a leaky gut, there's stuff going to come in, you know, without any sort of secretory IgA or response. Now we see the dendritic cell grabbing that endotoxin, showing it to the immune system. And this, uh, if we think back to that immunology slide, this is a driver of the TH17 pathway. Um, so we can see that any sort of fungal or bacterial overgrowth in the gut, particularly combined with the leaky gut, we're going to have a systemic inflammatory issue. Okay, so I mentioned short chain fatty acids, uh, Fecalibacterium prosnitzii, Roseburia, uh, Clostridia butyricum. These are examples of bacteria that produce butyrate. And butyrate is preferred fuel by our enterocytes. Um, the butyrate suppresses immune responses, and, including those cytokines that we looked at, um, protects against inflammatory disorders and disease, and it enforces tight junctions of the cells. So I use Acromantia and Fecalibacterium um, as kind of a proxy along with secretory IgA on the stool test that I use for trying to determine if there's a leaky gut situation in my patient. And I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these tests on patients, and I started to notice a pattern. So here's the kind of classic eczema gut that I find in my clinical practice. First, I find that they have high levels of Staph aureus and Streptococcus in their gut. Those are, of course, two bacteria. I also find that they have high levels of Candida, and that's a yeast, a fungal element. And I find this kind of leaky gut picture. So that is a combination of low or no Acromantia mucinophila, low or no Fecalibacterium prosnitzii, and often a low secretory IgA, but you can also have a high secretory IgA at first, which is there's a lot of inflammation and the gut is trying to respond, but kind of after time, if given enough time, it tends to go low and it just can't mount the response anymore. Then there's a second kind of profile that I can see. And sometimes it's, it's overlaid on top of that prior one, which is H. pylori and protozole overgrowth. All right, so what does the literature say? Is it just me saying that this is what I'm seeing in the guts of my eczema patients? Well, as it turns out, there's a lot of literature that is showing the same thing. And what they show is that patients with eczema appear to have increased intestinal permeability, increased leaky gut. And there's a positive association between the level of leaky gut, like how leaky it is and how bad their eczema is, it tracks together. And uh, the cytokines that are there with TH2, IL-4 and IL-13, um, they show up. And interestingly, they regulate um, Claudin-2 expression, which is leaky tissue. So our kidneys, for example, they're supposed to be leaky. And this IL-4 and IL-13, we're not sure if this is partially maybe what's driving the leaky gut, because remember those TH2 cells are producing these. So I think that's interesting. Short chain fatty acids, how do they relate to eczema? Well, this whole study, the name kind of says it all. It's um, severity of atopic disease inversely correlates with intestinal microbiota diversity and butyrate producing bacteria. So what this study found was that healthy infants and infants with like mild eczema have higher levels of these butyrate producing bacteria like Fecalibacterium prosnitzii compared to those with severe atopic dermatitis. So again, we see what is happening in the gut is directly impacting our eczema patients and their skin. Now you're gonna get a lot of questions from parents about probiotics. So, you know, aside from the food piece, the, the, the second most common thing is they come in and say, but I gave my baby probiotics and the eczema didn't go away. So let's see, what does the literature say about supplementing with probiotics? Well, it looks like studies kind of conflict. So there was a systematic review of 44 different studies that were using probiotics in eczema patients. And 50% showed, yep, it's gonna help if you give probiotics. And 50% showed, nope, it's not gonna help if you give probiotics. Well, what a, this is a coin toss, right? This isn't helpful at all. So what, what is going on? Why are we having some, such conflicting results? 
I think it's partially related to the fact that, you know, these studies are independent studies. So they're using different strains, doses, and courses of probiotics. But I also think it's this bigger issue that eczema is a very complicated disease. You know, as we see, there's a lot of systemic inflammation and just throwing a probiotic at somebody is unlikely to really resolve all of these issues. We have to go in and we have to deal with all of the root causes and clean it up. And unless it's very mild eczema, just throwing a probiotic at it is not going to be enough. Now, I do use probiotics, but not just probiotics. So, of course, the goal of naturopathic and functional medicine is, you know, we want to get down. We don't want to just play in the symptom realm, right? We don't want to use suppressive medications like topical steroids or dupixent to quash the immune response. We want to figure out you know, what are the root causes? What is driving this inflammation in our patients? And let's treat that and clean it up for them so that they don't need to be on medications and they can go on with their life in like a healthy, normal manner. And I like to tell my patients, you know, the minute I get them on my schedule, my goal is to get them off. And what I mean by that is I wanna go in, clean things up, teach them how to manage it, and then let them go. And um, if you treat skin, you will be so busy that you also will want to move your patients off your schedule because you will have a long wait list of people waiting to get in. And I really think it's the way medicine should be, you know, that we help patients and then they don't actually need to see us forever. So hopefully I have made the case for you that gut dysbiosis really is a driver of systemic inflammation, really is a driver of chronic dermatologic disease like eczema. So that is why I test and treat the gut. Okay, so let's take a look at testing the gut. What does that mean? So I know you know you guys are functional medicine practitioners and, and hopefully you're aware of these tests, but I use um, gut microbiome testing. So I use a stool test. I use the GI map by Diagnostic Solutions. I really love it. It's got H. pylori in it. It's cheaper than the other ones and it's been really effective for me. And then I also pair it with an oat organic acid test. Um, because I find that there are parts in the oat that help like fungal overgrowth. There's a kind of toxic exposure piece. I do um, also deal with mold and mycotoxins and that will come up a lot in your derm patients as well. So I do do other testing. I do Dutch hormone testing and you know all that as well. But my starting point is with the GMAP stool test and an oat. And then if necessary, I can go on and do other tests. And then I use the results of the labs as my roadmap. Now I can see exactly what the problems are, exactly what I need to clean up. And that is gonna help me get the person from point A to point B, which is clear. So let's look at a case of mine and see how this is done. So this is Tina, not her real name. And Tina is a 34 year old female and she's had eczema um, since infancy. So for the past 15 years, 15 years, she's been using tacrolimus on her eyes and face. And for the past six months, um, we can see that her eczema has just been absolutely terrible. And she has been prescribed hydrocortisone, triamcinolone, fluocinonide, betamethasone, clobetazole, and montelukast. These first five are all steroids. And I'll point out that Clobetazole is a class one super potent steroid. What that means is, so there's seven classes of steroids. Class seven is the weakest, like hydrocortisone. Clobetazole as a class one steroid is 600 times the potency of hydrocortisone. It is a very potent steroid. And then Mont Montelukas is a leukotriene inhibitor that she's taking orally. I think we can agree that these five steroids, including the clobetazole and the Montelukas and the tacrolimus, are just not working for her. She has severe eczema all over her body. She can't work like this. She has lost her job. Sometimes I think people think, oh, it's just eczema. It's just like a little rash here or there. They don't realize that eczema really can be devastating for adults. And also when it's pediatric eczema, the whole family is affected. When that infant is not sleeping, the parents aren't sleeping. Sometimes the siblings aren't sleeping. Really eczema can be very dramatic and life impacting. And I think we can see that in this patient. So my next steps are, I'm gonna run the stool test and the oat for her. And just to kind of give you a little bit wider view, like when I say she has eczema all over her body, she really has it all over her body. 
Um, and it's, it's really heartbreaking. In the first visit, she's wearing kind of like these gloves and she's oozing and she's like mopping up her face that's oozing with a tissue. I mean, it's just really heartbreaking, some of these patients. Okay, so I ran the stool test on her, the GI map, and um, let's see what we got. So first thing we see is that there is H. pylori or Helicobacter pylori. And the way that we interpret this value, 1.0 E3, is 1.0 times 10 to the third power. So if we move that three places, it's 1,000. The lab's cutoff is 1,000, so it really kind of is high. But I found that any H. pylori, it really causes issue for my patients. And I know there's a debate in the functional medicine and naturopathic world, is H. pylori bad? But for me, I really think it is. Every time I see it, it's causing problems. Um, it also has correlation with some diseases. For example, rosacea, we know that there's a pretty strong correlation between H. pylori and rosacea. And here's why I don't like it, is that first of all, you know, H. pylori drills into the stomach lining, which we know is inflammatory. And then the stomach is very acidic as it's supposed to be. You know, the pH can be too, that's very, very acidic. If you put stomach acid on shoe leather, it would dissolve it. So that's the, right? That's the whole point of stomach acid is to digest food. Um, but it's also a killer, right? We, as we talked about, we're swallowing saliva, we're bringing in food. You know, this is a cup of water, looks clean, but it's filled with microbes. So the stomach acid is really there to help um, catch and kill you know, all potential pathogens that we're bringing in orally. When H. pylori colonizes the stomach, it finds that it is too acidic. And so it starts producing um, enzymes like urease to neutralize the stomach acid and make it a more comfortable environment. And what I see is downstream effects of overgrowth of you know, unwanted bacterial fungus and protozoa. So uh, I talk about this more for acne because it shows up a lot in acne, but um, I almost only see protozoal overgrowth in the gut of patients with H. pylori. And I think it's because of this hypochlorhydria that's happening. So I always, always will treat H. pylori in patients, no matter what level it is, I'm gonna treat it. This is her kind of normal or commensal bacterial result. And let's go down here to phyla. So phyla, of course, are classifications of um, organisms. So um, for example, we are homo sapien, that is genus and species, that's very, um, specific. Our phyla is chordata, so anything with a spinal cord. These are, of course, bacterial phyla of Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes. And we saw in the research before that Bacteroidetes can be low in eczema patients. I do see that as well. But remember, she has H. pylori, and that can lead to overgrowth. So what we're seeing is that she's high on these two phyla, and together, Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes are showing us a snapshot, of about 85% of the good gut bacteria. We don't want it high. This is more like Goldilocks. We don't want it too low, but we don't want it too high. So she's got a lot of overgrowth, could be due to the hypochlorhydria. And what we see is that she's lacking Acromantia mucinophila, right? That's one of those keystone species, the Acromantia I love mucus. So immediately I'm kind of thinking of a leaky gut situation. This is um, kind of more dysbiotic or unwanted bacterial overgrowth. Uh, so we see the Staph aureus and Streptococcus that is so common in my eczema patients, but we also see Morganella, which is interesting. Morganella is a high histamine producer. We know that in eczema patient, there's a lot of histamine from mast cell response um, and that TH2 pathway. And something like this with you know an E7, I think this is, 85 million, it's a lot of Morganella growing and pumping out histamine. So this is not helping at all. It's definitely something we need to clean up. And lo and behold, remember she has H. pylori and she also has protozoa. So we see blastocystis hominis. Again, I know that there's some debate as to whether or not protozoa are commensal, not like Giardia, but like a blastocystis. I always treat all protozoa Again, it's really common in acne and other patients, and it's a Th1 driver. We saw a protozoa, Th1 response. So I don't want an immune um, uptick in my patients. So I will be treating this. Her antigliadin IgA is high. IgA, as we looked at, as the, the immunoglobulins in the gut. And antigliadin, gliadin is a glycoprotein found in gluten. So this patient is showing sensitivity to gluten, and absolutely, I'm gonna remove 
dairy, and also gluten from this patient's diet. Uh, in the oat, we see rabinose is the marker for candida overgrowth, and she is showing as high, so pretty classic picture. Um, oxalic acid is always high with candida. Uh, if you think back to the Krebs cycle, um, candida uh, steals um, isocitrate from our Krebs cycle, and one of its by for its own purposes, one of the byproducts is oxalic acid. Um, oat can be a little more difficult to learn how to interpret, but there's patterns like this that we'll see. Okay, so what am I going to do to help Tina? Um, the first thing I'll say is that, you know, this is naturopathic medicine, it's functional medicine. So of course, all treatment plans are individualized. What you're seeing here is not my treatment plan for every adult with eczema, for sure. It's using the lab results as the roadmap. And the second thing is that um, I see patients on an ongoing basis every approximately two and a half months until they're clear, until I'm ready to get them off of my schedule. So not all of this was done like all in one thing. It was done over several treatment plans. But, and, and, and I'm, as a naturopathic doctor, I know some do prescribe, but I don't use pharmaceuticals in like 99.9% .9 of my plans. So everything is gonna be, you know, herbal, and you know, supplement and naturopathic. So for H. pylori, you know, I do protocols like things with mastic gum, DGL, black human seed. For bacterial overgrowth, you know, all of our gorgeous herbs, coptis, Oregon grape, olive leaf, garlic. For fungal overgrowth, you know, and I love neem, rosemary, powder arco, uva ursi. The antiprotozoal herbs like artemisia and black walnut. Uh, there is an acromancia probiotic. Um, that's available, a live strain by Pendulum. Uh, for general support, I put her on a multivitamin to make sure we weren't encountering any nutrient deficiencies. I like spore-based probiotics. I use um, Biocidins Proflora 4R. Um, every adult patient, we work on 35 grams of fiber. This is part of that, you know, we, doctor is teacher docere. I wanna teach my patients how to be able to maintain this on their own. And when we look at the gut microbiome, it looks like about 35 grams of fiber per day is a pretty um, key amount. And that tends to help maintain a healthy gut microbiome. And then as we talked about, we cut out gluten. And then again, there's definitely gonna be skin barrier support, botanical topicals. I use different things to address the staph and other uh, topical issues and nasal spray to address the staph aureus in the nose. So let's see. How did Tina fare on this treatment plan? And remember, she's had this since infancy. So this was her at her first visit. We're going to look at the different body parts. Just two months later, we're already seeing like tremendous change. Now there is a lot of what we call PIH, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, but this is a different world for her. Um, then another three months later, so at the five-month mark, and then the seven-month mark. Uh, this is the lesions on her abdomen, and we can see that they're still present. And then the skin will start to heal itself. Uh, her hand, hand eczema is very, very common. Um, and we can see the improvements over time. She had it on both hands. Uh, this is the popliteal fossa behind the knee, a very, very classic spot for eczema. Uh, we can see at the two month mark, there is still some inflammation. It's not just the post-inflammatory. Um, now this the dark brown, it's no longer current inflammation, but it is this discoloration. Patients with skin of color like this patient, one of their main concerns is, you know, is this going to last? And what I find is usually not. Once we stop the inflammation, we clear this up, given enough time, they are going, their skin is going to return to normal. Dr. And this Greenberg, is what, I just want to stop you for a second. I yeah. know it's got a great comment there, but I, those, that's remarkable. I just want to have everyone just like take a breath and really look at what is possible with everybody having different results. That is remarkable. Like my sister has horrible, horrible psoriasis and sometimes looks like a burn victim. And so I know what something like this can do for, for people. I, I know that she's had suicidal thoughts over it before in the past too. We are talking about huge, huge life-changing results. Congratulations to you, Antina like, wow, thank you. I just had to yeah. say it. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Siobhan. Because, because this is important. This patient had had suicidal thoughts. It is That's actually very common in extreme um, dermatologic disease. 
it, it is a real problem because it is so devastating. I mean, imagine not being comfortable in, in your own skin. You can't get out of it. And I have patients tell me, I just, I just want to crawl out of my skin and they can't. It's devastating. Yeah. That is amazing. Thank you. And this is what Tina said at our last visit. You know, I couldn't imagine a life without eczema before. I didn't realize how much of my mental space and energy eczema took up. Now I feel free. You changed my life. Thank you. And I have to say, it's like, honestly, one of the best part about specializing in derm is the patients. They are so great. They will do everything you ask them to do. Um, they are so thankful. They will be your best, you know, marketing and, you know, warriors out there. All the eczema moms, I know they're posting about me in the Facebook groups because when I ask, how'd you hear about me? So-and-so and so-and-so in the Facebook group. I mean, they will be your marketing warriors if you change their lives like this. And, and it, you can. I mean, this is the beauty of our medicine is that we can get down and figure out what's going on and clean it up for people. Um, so, okay, so we focus on eczema here. Does it work for other dermatologic conditions? It does. Um, so here's, you know, some infant eczema, classic on the cheek. This is another, um, another uh, eczema patient, um, more eczema, eczema, some hand eczema. This is eczema herpeticum. Acne, I, I go about it in the same way. I test and treat the gut. Um, you can clean up deep cystic, nodular cystic acne, psoriasis. You know, you can clean up um, psoriasis as well. This is a different psoriasis patient. This is gutate psoriasis on the back. Um, scalp issues. I do alopecia areata. It works great on alopecia areata. Um, so as Siobhan mentioned, I do have a course. It's a root cause functional dermatology course. And um, there's 35 case studies. And, you know, this one, you know, it's just very kind of like general. In the training program, there's five case studies for each disease. So we cover acne, eczema, seborrheic dermatitis, psoriasis, rosacea, hair loss, and keratosis pilaris. And for each of those five cases for each disease, you're going to see the exact treatment plan that I've given at each visit, both oral and topical. And it's really extensive training on interpreting the GI map, the oat, the mycotoxin, the Dutch how do you treat things that you see in the gut, like H. pylori and SIBO? Um, so you really get a lot on this kind of extensive training. Um, there's two options. So there's a four-month mentorship cohort course that's just starting. And the benefit of this is if you're a licensed practitioner, you're in a live group. There are live sessions with me every other week. Um, we go through a lot of really great information. For example, um, I treat all via telemedicine. So one of the sessions, I really go in depth, like how can you treat chronic derm via telemed? It expands the base of um, patients that you can see. I do a whole course on my business model. Um, you know, I, I have pretty expensive visits. It's $1,000 for my first visit. That does not include 600 in labs. I was closed to new patients half of last year because I was at capacity and then I reopened this year and I'm already closed again, which is also why, as Siobhan said, I have this course because we really need more people out there doing this. There's also a self-paced course, and this is really for non-licensed practitioners who still can order labs, so like functional nutrition professionals. Um, here's a quick look at the syllabus. So the part one is all the fundamentals, all the foundational stuff that we're going to need when we get up and running with the derm section. And there's general derm, you know, topical, skin of color, pediatrics, skin aging, um, gut overview, liver overview, and then we get into the diseases. And here's some testimonials from past um, students who have taken it. They have an exit survey. 100% of students who have taken the course have said that they would recommend it to colleagues. And I've had everyone from dermatologists. So here is uh, Dr. Gershenhorn who says, yeah, it's the best education I've experienced as a dermatologist. It's been life-changing. Nurse practitioners, you know, priceless pearls, tools, and protocols to help my patients. Um, CNS and registered dietitians. It's the first time in a while I felt really inspired again. And nurse practitioners, you know, this has been an amazing experience. Um, NDs, you know, DOs, DCs, MDs. So really um, TCM, licensed healthcare practitioners. And as we kind of mentioned at the beginning, the need for dermatology specialists in functional medicine is huge. 
Number one disease in America, acne, 50 million Americans. 50 million Americans suffer from dandruff. 20 million suffer from eczema. These are not small numbers. These are huge numbers. These are the number one reasons why people go see a doctor. And it's functional dermatology is an untapped market, totally. Patients are desperate for this help. I get emails literally every day. People want to fly in. I've had people want to fly in from Australia and Saudi Arabia and Europe to see me, but I only treat in my three states when I'm even open. You can build a thriving practice in functional dermatology. And again, you oh, with the cohort, you get listed in a finder practitioner database and I send patients and students who have taken the course are getting a ton of new patients from the database. They really are. And like I said, derm patients are really the best patients you, you could ask for. So this course is a fit for you if you have a passion for dermatology, if you're looking for a cash-based specialty, if you're looking to grow your practice, you want to treat patients who are excited to do this and will follow your protocols. They want to pay cash. You want to see your patients improve and you want to have fun again treating patients. So I think we have some time for questions and I'd be happy to answer some. First of all, yeah, let's go big screen here so we can see your your face. Thank you so much. That was really phenomenal. And I'm very, very excited about this because everything you just said was true. Those results were amazing. Um, and Clarissa, my, my friend and helper here has put the information about the course in the chat for professionals or non-licensed professionals who can still order labs. That right. would, would be the self-paced course that you can do. And if you are able to, if you wanted to do it, you can use the code Siobhan and that will get you $200 off. And that is up through um, just, I think it's tomorrow night. So Dr. Greenberg has never discounted this before. She's actually never worked with anyone else to do this. It's always just been on her own. But when I met you through through uh, Jen Fugo, our mutual friend, and because Jen texted me and was like, do you know Dr. Julie Greenberg? And I was like, nope. She goes, well, because she knows I'm really into skin. And um, we hit it off and I was like, oh my gosh, yes, let's do this. I need to tell people about you and about what you offer. So then I, then I asked Dr. Greenberg for a discount for the people who came in through um through my community and i really appreciate that so i appreciate the extra you know extra special love um let's get to some q and a's and here we go so question about the what how how long did tina sustain that does she have to stay on um supplements for the rest of her life how, how are they doing no no my goal is always to have patients again, you know, go about their lives. And so we, we ramp down on things and see how they're doing. Um, I usually give patients the option, whether they want to do the retesting or not, or just see how it goes. She just wanted to see how it goes is again, she hadn't worked for a while. So, you know, she didn't have just yeah. money at hand. Um, so we ramped down and, um, yeah, I mean, as far as I know, she's still doing well. I haven't, I haven't heard from her in, uh, like a year or two. And, you know, usually if, patient, if you can, heal them, they will come back to you if they're having trouble. So, um, you know, again, with the training, like she knows 35 grams of fiber a day, she knows the topicals, she knows to get on top of things the minute she sees something. I mean, all of this is, is part of the work that I do with the patients while they're on board, but no, she doesn't need to be on, you know, any sort of stuff. She just needs to maintain the work we've done. Amazing. Uh, I think you've already covered this. Kim is asking, what about milk for infants? Yeah, so it, it is a little bit tougher when they're, once they hit 12 months, it's much easier because a world of a lot of different formulas opens up. Um, obviously, you know, mom's breast milk is the best, but then I'll, I'll take mom off of like dairy and gluten and stuff. If that's not an option, um, you know, I'm not a pediatrician. And so at that age, I do have them work with their pediatrician. There are some, you know, non um, dairy formulas out there. Um, but it does get a lot easier once they hit one year and then a whole world of formulas opens up to them. And what is the cost of the course? So the um, the cohort is 8,000 if paid one time or 8,500 if paid over the course of four months. Um, and the self-paced course is 5,000. You don't get listed in the finder practitioner database. You, you don't have the cohort and all the Q and A and extra stuff as well. Um, 
And again, with the cohort, you get listed in the Find a Practitioner database and have the opportunity to have patients who are looking for this exact treatment find you. And that's also just for licensed practitioners. Yes, that one is for licensed practitioners only. The go at your own pace is for non-licensed, but you can order like GI map and the like. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Rukshana, I have been doing nutrigenomic testing and find certain SNPs for skin issues. Would this be a possible tool? Do you deal with genetics at all? Or I don't. I mean, there, we didn't get into the topicals again. There's something okay. called filagrin, which is a protein in the skin. And there's an FLG filagrin <clears throat> gene that... A lot of people with eczema, particularly those with early onset eczema, have a filagrin gene mutation. But with the gene stuff, you know, and what I tell patients is, you know, genes load the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. I think people become a little fatalistic, like, oh, well, you know, my mom had eczema, my grandma and my dad and brothers and sisters. And so it's like, oh, of course I'm going to have eczema. And no, you know, that's not our medicine. Our medicine is the gun may be loaded, but we're not going to let the environment pull the trigger. So I don't do like SNP or genetic testing on patients. Um, but I can assume that the ones who have had early onset eczema probably have a filagrin gene mutation that's kind of making them more prone to it. Got it. Um, do you recommend your people take Saccharomyces boulardii, Acromancia mucinophila therapeutically as an intentional probiotic? So I really only use a Saccharomyces boulardii in cases of like pretty bad diarrhea because it is a yeast. And as you've seen, most of my eczema patients are having fungal candida overgrowth. So I think, you know, there's kind of juries out and some people do react to Saccharomyces boulardii. So unless there's really a diarrhea problem, I don't really use it. Uh, but I do use the Acromancia mucinophila, particularly in the patients who, you know, we can see have none or low. Um, so any, what if the people, what if the students want to continue with ongoing training after the cohort? I mean, it's really a comprehensive, uh, four month, but there is as part of the cohort, um, you're part of the, um, root cause dermatology Facebook group where all the other alums are there and we get together and uh, students keep, graduates keep asking. And I keep saying, I am going to do something for the alums where we get together in a forum and, and we're going to be doing some sort of work together. But right now there's, there's the closed Facebook forum for graduates. Okay. Um, what do you do for, I'm wondering if chronic anal fissures could be related to this. My son has had them for over two years. They haven't healed after trying so many things, including restrictive diets. So, you know, I don't know, anal fissures, you know, is a little bit that's not like a typical thing that my patient is dealing with. So I'm not sure, you know. You know who could help you with that? I bet, I, I don't know. Okay, first of all, I don't know. But look up Crane Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S in Portland, Oregon. He or Ilana Gervich. Ilana Gervich, of course, the queen. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but Crane, I, the reason I'm saying Crane is because I know he, he works with hemorrhoids a lot. Oh, okay. So that's, uh, he's he's, focused on the butthole and um god bless him god bless him <laughs> uh, like in my new gut summit like i literally said would you please come on and just talk about hemorrhoids and he did god bless him so anyway that's what i wanted to tell you that he's in portland oregon and dr alana gervich is also in portland oregon they're both geniuses um okay so where is the q a box it's in the bottom hold on okay isn't i think we've so people are saying, does the eczema seem to come back? No. And if they do- I mean, then... so it depends, right? I never say to patients, I'm going to cure you because a right. cure makes it sound like we're done and we never need to see this again. Right. Your eczema patients are obviously prone to getting eczema. And if their gut dysbiosis and everything else goes off again, they can get it again. But that's why- all the work that I do and all the training when I train the doctors, you know, we're still, we're talking about, we're getting their fiber up. We're working on all of the things to get the, the patients to, you know, almost have a user manual for their eczema so that they can better manage this going forward and hopefully not need to come back and keep seeing us. It's not a guarantee. Of course. And nor are any cash results paying p patients, right? This is obviously everyone use your common sense. No one is uh, promising that you will get rich off of this. Uh, Marilee is asking how much is taught regarding starting a practice? So um, I don't, it, the, it's not a business course, but I have a lot of practitioners who are, um, for example, they're like MD dermatologists or, you know, NP more conventionally trained, 
They're working in more conventional settings, but they've been passionate about functional medicine and are taking the course. And we do talk a little bit about how you can, because I teach telemed, because I have a whole session on telemed and a whole session on my business practice, we do talk a little bit about, okay, how are you going to, you can set up your telemed pr practice grow that out while you're still working in your conventional job and getting a salary and then transition over when you're ready. So there's a lot of uh, practitioners in the course who are doing that kind of a transition or you know, maybe we're naturopathic doctors working for somebody else who wanna go out on their own. Um, what about uh, patients post-Accutane that have developed e uh, eczema? That's not something I see that often. So obviously if they were on Accutane, they, they were on that, I'm assuming for acne. Um, you know, the only thing I connection I can think of is, so Accutane basically kills off the sebocytes, which are the sebum producing glands. Sebum is the oil. Um, people do get like dry lips and they can get dry skin, but is it really eczema, like a TH2 pathway? Eczema is kind of a catch-all for any sort of skin rash. That's a patient where I would really like want to see the gut results and like, is it a typical eczema gut? Is it really a TH2 allergic pathway or are they just having some sort of skin barrier compromise and rashes? That, that would be my thinking on that patient. What is the difference between eczema and psoriasis? Huge difference. So eczema is predominantly this TH2 uh, pathway. We talked about the allergic. It can have components of TH1 and TH17. Psoriasis has no TH2 pathway, no allergic, and it's a disease of systemic inflammation. And what's happening is an overproduction and overproliferation of the keratinocytes or skin cells. So we get those thicker plaques we think of. Traditionally, where we would see eczema is in the flexural surfaces. So the folds of the arms, what we call the antecubital fossa, behind the knees, the popliteal fossa. More classically, uh, psoriasis is on the extensor surfaces, so the outside elbow and the top of the knees, but they're totally different diseases and need to be approached in totally different ways. Okay, all righty. Um, let's see, how do you help patients with severe itching when coming off topical and oral cortisone and antihistamines? Yeah, so mostly antihistamines have been found not to help that much with the eczema itch. It seems to be this more IL-33, a different one, but with topical steroids, there is something called topical steroid withdrawal syndrome that we do not want to throw patients into. So of course I teach this very, very, very slow ramp down. I will never just pull a patient off of topical steroids or even the calcineurin inhibitors like tacrolimus or the PDE4 inhibitors like Eucrisa because you will throw someone's system into distress because these suppressive medications, it's like holding a coil down, right? And if we suddenly let go of the coil, what happens? boom, right? It springs up even higher with all that stored up energy. So I do very, very slow and gentle ramp downs on those types of topicals while we're healing these underlying systems. And they will naturally be able to use less and less. And then there's a visit where it's like, okay, are you still using the hydrocortisone? No, I can't remember the last time I used it. Great. Right, cool. Um, and we'll, we'll wrap up in about four minutes, but I just wanted to um, ask a couple more questions. And that is, uh, what types of fiber do you recommend? It's almost, it's almost often difficult for people with leaky gut. So uh, the fiber, number one is food. So I, I have a exercise where every patient or parent of patients has to go home and track what they're eating for three or four days. Don't change anything. And we want to see what's your average daily intake of fiber. And then I can start to work on ramping them up. Food is number one. If for some reason, like people really can't get there with the food, you know, we can talk about some supplements, but there's no nothing in a jar that's going to outdo nature when it comes to fiber and the food that fiber is packaged in. So we are predominantly working on food. And that also, by increasing the fiber and the plants, it tends to decrease the more inflammatory stuff like sugar and, you know, all the rest of the stuff. I want to share screen for just a second so I can show you. Um, uh, somebody's asking, is there an application for the course? And the answer is yes. Yeah, so you're going to apply and upload your license. And um, within the day, I'm going to get back to you as, as long as you're a qualified licensed professional. Um, I will get back to you with um, the payment and the special coupon code for Siobhan. It's a little bit different for the mentorship, but I'll give you because there's two payment plans. So 
I'll be getting back to everybody today who applies. Okay. It's very straightforward. At first I was confused and then I was like, oh, okay, I got it. So it's, it's quite, it's very straightforward. Um, okay. We have one more question and then we will bolt. Thank you so much. Let's pop some love into the chat for Dr. Greenberg, because this is a labor of love and also a mission and a passion. And I'm so glad you all came. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, any suggestion for a practitioner with ba for a baby with eczema since three month old and local functional MD hasn't helped? Mom is gluten free and dairy free except for grass fed butter. Yeah, I would go test that baby's gut and yeah. um, figure out what's going on. I can pretty much guarantee you the, the classic infant, infant gut is, you know, no acromancia, no fecalibacterium, low secretory IgA. I know that baby's got a leaky gut. You can see what else is going on in it. I do a lot of pediatrics in the course. I see a lot of pediatrics. Obviously, there's a lot of pediatric eczema. Um, it's definitely treatable. I've seen patients, infants with failure to thrive because the eczema has been so bad. They, they need to get a handle on all of this overgrowth and dysbiosis and, and of course the topicals that I teach and infants do great. Okay. Do you treat, is it vitiligo? Vitiligo. vitiligo. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I do treat vitiligo. It's not, it's not, I don't cover the like melasma and vitiligo, which are kind of the melanocyte issues in the course. Um, but it is something I treat. Okay. All right. I have to go. Unfortunately, thank you all so much for being here. I do hope you will join Dr. Greenberg so you all can spread this information around the world and heal your patients and help your practice and be on this mission of filling in this huge, huge need and gap in the world of functional and traditional medicine, which is root cause dermatology. Great job. Thank you all so much. We'll send you the replay. Um, and that coupon code, I think expires tomorrow night at midnight. So have at it. Okay. Take care. Bye. Thank, right. you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks, Clarissa.